Hello, boys and girls. Welcome back to another episode of Cut the Shit, Get Fit. I am your lovely host, Rafael Matuszewski, and this is another edition of my podcast car vlog thing that I do. Um, what I'm going to talk about today... Oh, my camera is just falling all over the place. Um is going to require some visual thinking and just visuals in general. Um, We're going to talk about the ankle today. So when it comes to exercising exercises involving the lower extremities, meaning your legs, biomechanically, you need quite a bit of dorsiflexion to do things like squats, lunges, step-ups, and even things like you pushing a sled that requires a certain angle at your ankle and your big toe, and also something called your midfoot to do the activity correctly without, you know, putting any kind of sheer forces in um, places where they shouldn't go. And looking ahead at this traffic, I think I'm going to have enough time to describe all this. So if you know anything about anatomy or somewhat of anatomy, you probably understand that there are two bones in your shin called your tibia and your fib, right? Your fibia. Um, These two bones work along along each other and kind of create this, um, I almost call it like a fork. So I'm kind of pointing down with my two fingers and they kind of sit on top of your ankle joint that has things like the talus and the calcaneus, right? So when your knee goes forward, for example, in a lunge or a squat, those two bones that make up your shin should articulate, meaning move in a certain way in conjunction with the talus bone and all the little bones in your foot that make up the ankle joint, the midfoot, and the heel, which is your calcaneus. And when people don't have the mobility in those ankles, a lot of times you'll see people and they squat, they kind of get to their end range and they like shift their hips back and they almost feel like they're falling over due to the lack of mobility in their ankles. But to take kind of, kind of a step further than this, a lot of times when I do this with uh, new clients or patients, I also check their hip mobility because usually when you think it's like an ankle issue, you look at um, the hips and it's like, whoa, their hips are really shitty. So maybe it's not their ankles, it's actually their hips, and then you test their ankles, and you're like, oh, your ankle mobility is fine, it's just your hips. But say for the sake of this episode, um, we're talking about just ankle stuff today. So if you know you are a person with really bad ankles really bad and you've had a history of like even spraining ankles too because this is another thing we're going to get into um and say you know that you have tight ankles because when you go foam roll before a workout they're just super tight and jacked up they could be rock hard or um you just know that when you go to physio or massage and they work on your ankles they're just freaking terrible and painful so when it comes to having adequate dorsiflexion meaning you trying to drive your knee forward over your toes, um, which is dorsiflexion, and plantar flexion is think of you trying to plant your foot down to the ground and push off. So when you do like a calf raise, that's plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion is where you push your knee forward over your toes. So in order to have adequate dorsiflexion, um, the musculature and the tissue on the back side of your calf needs to have some sort of give in order to you know provide you with adequate dorsiflexion so sometimes the first you know 
step of defense or offense in this case if you think about it to improve your uh, ankle mobility to move better is some soft tissue stuff so this is where you know foam rolling you using a lacrosse ball whatever it is on your calves before a workout or on a daily basis as like a um mobility enhancement tool whatever you want to call it um it's kind of the first line of defense and when it comes to um manual therapy that's a whole nother layer that you can add because you will gain some range of motion when you uh, see a physical therapist or a chiropractor uh, to release some soft tissue maybe mobilize the joints in the ankle knee whatever it is and boom you got some more range of motion Um, when it comes to having adequate dorsiflexion a lot of people go like oh i'm just going to do ankle mobility drills Right And yeah, they can work, but they'll get you only so far. So when you look at the dynamic of how the foot works, so if you imagine when you go into plantar flexion, meaning the toes go down onto the ground when you're walking, your foot is going to go into pronation, right? So think of it, if you have your heel on the ground and you're taking your step, your big toe when it's trying to push off your foot's going to go into inversion meaning like the pronation um, where your arch will kind of lean into the inside of your midline and then as you push off your foot will go into supination over to the other edge of the foot and you have this constant kind of like tilting action at the ankle right so If you think about it, every step you take is a series of plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, as well as pronation and supination of the ankle joint itself. So really, your ankle actually goes through a rotational movement um, while walking, while squat, uh, I won't get into that, while walking, and especially when you're lunging. Right, So given that, a lot of ankle mobility drills tend to focus on only plantar flexion and um, dorsiflexion, which is okay, but it can only get you so far. So going off of that logic, it makes sense to train your foot to go into pronation and um, supination and train those um, planes of motion. Right, so if you've been following my work for a while, um, you know I'm a huge advocate of functional range conditioning. You probably know that I teach kin stretch, and you probably know if you've been following me recently that I've taken my functional release therapist course for the upper extremity. And we utilize something called pails and rails for a lot of. Um, exercises mobility exercises to unlock um, some new range of motion so what I usually give to people to increase their dorsiflexion is pails and rails in a dorsiflex position essentially so if you go to a half kneel position and you think of driving your knee past your toe and getting to your end range that would be the stretch you'd stay in and you do pails and rails in that So for those people who don't know what pails and rails stands for, because it's an abbreviated term, it's progressive and regressive angular isometric loading. Meaning, I hold the stretch for two minutes, and then when I get to the point of that two minute mark, I do an isometric contraction, and with pails it's progressive, so if I'm stretching my ankle into dorsiflexion, my pails contraction would be my toes pushing into the ground for about 10 seconds, I would let go of that contraction, and usually what happens is kind of like PNF stretching, you'll notice that you'll be able to get a little bit more range of motion because you did an isometric contraction. Then from there, I would do a rails, meaning regressive, so I'm gonna regress the angle of my dorsiflexion, meaning I'm gonna try to drive my toes up off the ground to lower, uh, close the angle of the stretch and this um, 
mechanism of attacking the joint um, in both directions. And I do this constantly to reinforce in the nervous system and influence the muscle cells to rebuild and remodel the way I want it to. All right? So now that I'm doing ankle mobility drills of dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, and pails and rails in dorsiflexion, I should be able to get more range of motion. But, but I'm limited because what we just talked about, when I move my foot into a walking pattern, into gait, we spoke about how it goes into pronation and supination as well. So think about almost like a teeter-totter going back and forth, right? So that's essentially what your ankle's doing. So if I'm only training in this linear fashion of dorsiflexion and um, plantar flexion, geez, I'm like running out of brain cells today. Um, I'm leaving a lot on the table because I'm not training what my ankle's designed to actually do. So that being said, wouldn't it make sense to train my ankle joint um, in inversion and eversion, meaning pronation, supination, right? So something as simple as going back into that half kneel position where I'm leaning forward into dorsiflexion to stretch out my ankle, having my foot, so say I'm using my right foot and attacking the right ankle, and turning it out to the right a little bit further and then going into the uh, dorsiflexion stretch. So I am in in dorsiflexion, but if you imagine turning your uh, foot out to the right, your inside of your foot will fall into pronation just slightly. So now we're getting that tilting effect like that teeter-totter and working pronation and dorsiflexion at the same time. And then I would do the same thing going back to neutral with my foot and then turning it in towards my midline. And now when I go into dorsiflexion with my ankle, I'm also working some supination. So now I'm working all the parameters of what my ankle joint is supposed to do on a daily basis. And then if you think about it that way, if our ankle joint is meant to be a rotational joint then you would want to do things like ankle cars so again if you haven't followed my stuff cars is an abbreviation for controlled articular rotations meaning putting your joints through the range of motion that it's designed to move in when you do this you reinforce to the body and the nervous system that that joint is supposed to move that way and you're constantly reinforcing the information that your ankle joint, for example, is more than just going into um, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion constantly. So this is where kind of the magic happens because a lot of people roll their ankles like crazy. And that being said, it's because the tissues that are responsible for pronation and supination have not been trained outside of just going into dorsi and plantar flexion, right? So if you train those tissues, train the joint to be versatile in different environments, this is how you literally become more bulletproof. And if you bought my ebook, The Ironclad Body Training System, this is a selfish plug, I go into just kind of like scratching the surface of pails and rails and how to become bulletproof So then when you go into real life situations, when you pick up your kid or you run after them and they run off to the other direction and you cut on the grass, your ankle's not going to buckle over and you're going to tear something, right? This is how you become resilient. So when you apply all these principles and now when you retest your squad and say you've been doing this kind of protocol of pails and rails and different, um, all different Um, motions the ankle can do and you do ankle cars and all those things and some soft tissue stuff with a practitioner and you go squat lunge you'll notice that the mechanics improve drastically right so 
that was a lot of information really, really quickly. <laughs> but these are the things that people need to know and understand about their body in order for them to move and feel better. So if you want, guys want more context, maybe I'll actually put a presentation together because I haven't done this in so long to kind of show um, the concept behind how the ankle actually moves the right um, way in a perfect case scenario. So I'm going to leave it at there. Hopefully I blew some people's minds about how your ankles work when it comes to squatting, lunging, doing step ups and pushing a sled. So if you want more info, feel free to reach out, message me on Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is. So if you don't follow me, hit the show notes and I have the link for my Facebook and Instagram, I think on there. So do that. Ask me questions. That'd be great. I love you guys. Thank you for the support until next time.